I warmly welcome you to the lecture Introduction to Law. In several units, we will cover the basics of German, European and international law, especially civil and commercial law. My name is Marco Starke. Since April 2021, I hold the chair of civil law and business law at the University of Wuppertal. I will upload all units of the lecture here on YouTube. In addition, you get the PowerPoint presentations as PDF on the learning platform Moodle. In this first unit, I will give you at first a short history of the German legal system. Then we will take a look at the branches of law and jurisdiction of the hierarchies of norms and of the method of interpretation. Of German law lie in two roots, the laws of Germanic tribes as well as the law of the Romans. The Germanic tribes had written law collections such as the Edictum Theoderici. These law collections were based on the Romans legal systems since the Germanic tribes lived on former Romanic areas and therefore had to integrate the Romans legal systems. Beginning in the 12th century, next to the canon law, different local customary laws were recorded in thematically unsorted collections. The most famous one is the Sachsenspiegel 1220 till 1227 by Eike von Repko. Such collections included typical phenomena of the Germanic legal tradition, such as the payment of a so-called Wehrgeld by the perpetrator to the relatives of a killed person. In parallel development, Roman law developed. It also applied in the German Middle Ages when local law did not offer a solution for the respective case. At the time of the Enlightenment, the law of reason spread. Roman law was interpreted and adapted to suit the times. After the establishment of different states in Germany, such as Prussia, different own legal systems were formed in some of these states. For example, the general Prussian land law, or in German, Allgemeines Landrecht für die Preußischen Staaten, in short, ALR. This was enacted in 1794 and summarized all applicable laws. The ALR emphasized traditional privileges of the nobility. On the other hand, in other states, no own laws were established. Instead, such as in the Grand Duchy of Baden, the French Code Civil of 1804 was applied. At the beginning of the 19th century, another impact formed the German legal system. Representatives of the historical school of law, such as Friedrich Karl von Savigny, spoke out against further codification of private law. They believed that law should be derived from the original Roman sources. However, in 1870-1871, the German Empire was created by uniting several small states. After long preparatory work, the civil code was promulgated in 1896. It came into force on the 1st of January 1900. It was named Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch, in short BGB. This code is still in force in Germany today in an often adapted form. After the rise of the National Socialist era in 1933, the law degenerated into a means of power for the regime and was reduced to absurdity through special legislation and political show trials at the so-called People's Court. The end of the National Socialist era also meant a new beginning for the German legal system. The rip of the crucial reign 
of the National Socialist German laws should ensure that these happenings would never take place in the future history again. Therefore, every law today must be measured against the standards of the German Constitution. The basic law of 1949 called Grundgesetz, or in short, GG. The Grundgesetz, the basic law, consists mainly of fundamental rights, the so-called Grundrechte, and the principle of the rule of law, the so-called Rechtsstaatlichkeit. The result of World War II, Germany was divided into Western and Eastern Germany. Therefore, two different legal systems were formed in Germany. By the ongoing development of the legal system in the Western part of Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, or in German Bundesrepublik Deutschland, BG, BRD, followed its historical roots. The legal system in the Eastern part, the German Democratic Republic, GDR, and German Deutsche Demokratische Republik, was influenced by the Soviet Union's legal and social system. The division of Germany was ended by the Unification Treaty in 1990. With the re reunification, the Western law became the constitution and law for the whole of Germany. The laws of the former GDR gradually ceased to apply under transitional agreements. Let's take a look on the sources of law and the hierarchy of norms. In opposition to case law, mainly known in relation to the US and UK law, the German legal system is based on codified law. The principle that law in Germany has to be codified leads to the fact that by the time the German legal system has been growing to a legal system of innumerable codified laws. This leads, on the one hand, to a high complexity of rules and German legal language. On the other hand, the high degree of codification leads to a high level of legal certainty. Though German law is not case law, it also consists of case law. Case law becomes part of German law if the jurisdiction interprets the German law. It is a controversial issue if this case law is a source of law or just an aid, an aid of interpretation of the German law. Nevertheless, judgments by the German Federal Constitutional Court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, are binding for all federal states, federal and states constitutional bodies. In addition, laws need to be interpreted under the principle of the uniformity of the legal system. This leads to the necessity that all laws also need to be interpreted in regards to the jurisdiction of the highest German courts. The last source of law in Germany is the so-called customary law. This is law that is not codified but accepted as law because it has been applied for a long time. Customary law is also binding judges. The German legal system consists of a hierarchy of norms. The hierarchy of norms leads to the necessity that the norm of a lower rank has to be in line with the norms of a higher rank. If the norm of a lower rank isn't in line with the norm of a higher rank, it is void. Invalid. Think of norms are the norms of the Constitution, the basic law, the Grundgesetz. The Constitution takes precedence over all other laws. According, according to Article 1, Section 3 of the Basic Law, the fundamental rights of the Grundgesetz are binding the legislative the jurisdiction 
as well as the executive. In addition, the legislative is bound by the constitutional order and the executive as well as the jurisdictions are bound by law and rules, Article 20, Section 3 of the Basic Law. The rank under the Constitution is formed by the so-called formal laws. These are laws that are passed by the legislative federal parliament or the parliament of the states. Formal law also deals with more with the ways in which the law is enforced, procedural and process law, as well as jurisdictional rules. Laws made by the executive are called material laws. The material law consists of regulations and directives. Material law generally only has an effect on the executive. In opposite to formal law, material law tends to concern the rights and duties of legal subjects, as well as the establishment of legal institutions, such as the contract, the office, or the marriage. The European Union has a fact if there is no national rule or if a national rule conflicts with the law of the European Union. Therefore, the law of the European Union enjoys the primacy of application. The law of the European Union is divided into primary and secondary law. The primary law consists of the treaties. The Treaty on the European Union, TEU, or in German EUV, and on the other hand, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, TFEU, or in German AEUV. The law consists of numerous regulations, directives, and decisions. These are derived from the principles and objectives set out in the treaties. International law applies on the basis of international treaties. An opposite of the law of the European Union, international law does not enjoy primacy of application. Instead, international law stands next to the German national law. So international law needs to be taken into account when interpreting German national law. Let's take a look on the branches of law and jurisdictions. German law is divided into two major areas, private law and public law. Private law regulates the legal relationships between individual citizens. In this context here, public law is subdivided into what is known as public law and criminal law in turn. The core of private law is the civil law, which is codified in the German Civil Code. Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch, BGB. It contains regulations that affect the everyday life of a citizen, such as sales contracts, tenancy agreements, but also regulations on marriages and divorces or on inheritance. In addition, private law also consists of commercial law. This only applies to merchants. It is regulated in the Commercial Code, or in German, Handelsgesetzbuch, HGB. Furthermore, private law contains labor law, which deals with the legal relationships between employees and employees. Finally, private law also includes copyright and patent law. These deal with the protection of so-called intangible goods, goods, meaning the protection of human ideas. Public law, on the one hand, regulates the relationships between individuals and public authorities. The Federal Republic of Germany, the federal states, regional authorities like districts, counties and municipalities and public corporations. On the other hand, it regulates the relations 
between the public powers. This includes administrative law, constitutional law, and international law. In addition, public law, as already mentioned, also consists of criminal law. Criminal law sanctions conducts that violates the law. The norms whose violation is sanctioned by criminal law are regulated in the criminal code, Strafgesetzbuch, and other codes. Criminal law also includes criminal procedural law, which is regulated in the Code of Criminal Procedure, Strafprozessordnung. Germany. The judiciary is divided into five independent branches of court, which are distinguished by the terms ordinary and special jurisdiction. Ordinary jurisdiction includes civil and criminal courts, while special jurisdiction includes administrative courts, labor courts, social courts, and fiscal courts. The term ordinary jurisdiction is historically explained by the fact that in the past only the civil and criminal courts were staffed with independent judges. In contrast, administrative and fiscal jurisdiction was exercised by civil servants, bound by instructions. In all branches of the courts, there are courts of the federal states and of the federation itself. There are several instances within the individual branches of the courts. Instances are levels of judicial procedure that are superior to each other. As a rule of thumb, there are three instances. The first two are courts of the states. The highest instance is mostly a federal court. Administrative labor and social courts have three levels of jurisdiction, while the fiscal courts have just two. The highest instances are the Federal Administrative Court, the Federal Labor Court, the Federal Social Court, and the Federal Fiscal Court. Another federal court, the Federal Patent Court, is established for disputes concerning the commercial use of patents, which can be applied for and granted for inventions at a federal patent office. Constitutional jurisdictions occupies a special position. The federal constitutional court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, has the function of the guardian of the basic law. The instances of ordinary jurisdiction are district courts, so-called Amtsgerichte, regional courts, Landgerichte, which can be the first or the second instance depending on the importance of the case. Then we have higher regional courts, or so-called Oberlandesgerichte, and as highest instance, the Federal Court of Justice, the Bundesgerichtshof, BGH, which is seated in Karlsruhe. jurisdiction over civil disputes. These are disputes that belong to the area of private law outlined above. Civil jurisdiction also includes voluntary jurisdiction, the so-called freiwillige Gerichtsbarkeit. This is regulated in the Act of, on Proceedings in Family Matters and in Matters of Voluntary Jurisdiction. German Gesetz über das Verfahren in Familiensachen und in den Angelegenheiten der freiwilligen Gerichtsbarkeit. It is primarily responsible for guardianship and probate matters, but also for registry matters, which are important for companies. A civil case begins with the filing of a lawsuit. The plaintiff and defendant are called parties. The parties face each other on an equal footing. The plaintiff substantiates his claim. The defendant denies the allegations in whole or in part. 
both parties can present evidence and produce witnesses. The court only examines what the parties submit. It does not investigate ex officio. This is why in civil proceedings one speaks of party rule. This court, Amtsgericht, is the first instance for amounts in dispute up to and including 5,000 euros. The amount in dispute is the value of the matter in dispute. If a certain sum of money is not being claimed, the court sets it. The court costs and lawyers' fees are determined according to the amount in dispute. In addition, the district courts hear tenancy disputes, divorces and disputes arising from them and other special matters. Proceedings in the first instance end with a judgment, unless they have been concluded in another way. For example, by withdrawal of the action or by amicable agreement, a settlement. The judgment is final if the parties do not appeal or if it is no longer possible to appeal. Appeals are understood to be the possibility of challenging a court's decision and demanding its review by a higher court, a higher instance. Important legal remedies are appeal and revision. In an appeal, the higher instance reviews both the facts and the legal side of the case, and the trial is reopened. Appeals against judgments of the district courts are heard by the regional courts, and appeals against judgments of the regional courts are heard by the higher regional courts. Appeals can only be lodged if the appeal volume, which may differ from the amount in dispute, exceeds 600 euro. The revision, on the other hand, only examines whether the lower court applied the law correctly. Depending on the case, the BGH or the OLG are responsible. Revision is generally only admissible if the case is of fundamental importance or the judgment deviates from the decisions of the Federal Supreme Court, the BHG, BGH, in a similar case. This is to ensure the uniform interpretation of the law. Courts are responsible for applying criminal law, which is laid down especially in the criminal code, the so-called Strafgesetzbuch, STGB. However, many other laws also contain criminal law provisions, for example, the Narcotics Act, the Assembly Act, and the Foreign Trade and Payments Act. Filing of charges by the public prosecutor's office. This is usually preceded by a criminal complaint filed with the police, the district court or the public prosecutor's office. In the preliminary proceedings that now begin, the public prosecutor's office, in cooperation with the police, determines whether there is a sufficient suspicion of a criminal offense. If this is the case, charges must be brought. The public prosecutor's office acts according to the principle of legality. This means that it, oblige, that it is obliged to prosecute a criminal offense. The only exemption are so-called application offenses. Indeed, the person concerned must file a criminal complaint in order for the offense to be prosecuted. If the application offense is also a private prosecution offense, charges are only brought if this is in the public interest. Otherwise, the injured person only has the option of a private prosecution. A criminal offense is suspected. 
preliminary proceedings are initiated. If the accused is sufficiently suspicious, the main proceedings are opened. With the opening decision, the accused becomes the defendant. The court has to investigate the facts of the case and prove the accused guilt. In doing so, it is not bound by the evidence presented by the public prosecutor, but can take evidence itself, hear witnesses, consult experts. The accused has the right of defense. He can be represented by a lawyer. This is mandatory in the case of serious offenses. If the accused cannot pay for a defense lawyer, the court appoints a public defender at state expense. The criminal proceedings end with a verdict. Unless an appeal is lodged, it becomes final and is enforced. In the first instance, several courts can be responsible. The court decides as a single judge on a misdemeanor where a custodial sentence of up to two years or a fine is to be expected. The court decides as a court of lay assessors at the district court with one or two judges, two lay assessors on felonies and misdemeanors with custodial sentences up to four years. We have a grand criminal chamber at the regional court with two or three judges and two lay assessors on serious crimes and as a jury court on homicide. And criminal senate decides at the higher regional court with five just judges uh, cases for state protection um, crimes such as treason, terrorist acts of violence. Lay judges are honorary judges. They have no legal training and have the same rights and duties as professional judges at the trial when deliberating on the verdict. A convicted person may appeal against the judgment. Juvenile criminal law applies to offenses committed by juveniles aged 14 till 18. It is also often applied to adolescents 18 to 20 years, 21 years. Juvenile criminal law provides for educational measures. For example, the instruction to perform community service. If this, not, if, if this is not sufficient, disciplinary measures can be imposed. For example, the requirement to make good the damage or youth detention. Youth detention is imposed for particularly serious or repeated offenses. It is served in a juvenile penal institution and lasts at minimum six months to a maximum of 10 years. We have special juvenile courts who decide these cases. Administrative offenses are to be distinguished from criminal offenses. These are violations of state commands and prohibitions that are not so serious that the penalty would have to be imposed. They are punished by administrative authorities, which impose a fine by way of a penalty notice. Minor administrative offenses, the most common of which are speeding and parking offenses, are punished by a warning fine. In public law, administrative courts are responsible for disputes between citizens and the state authorities. They offer citizens legal protection if they believe their rights have been violated by an administrative measure. Administrative courts decide, for example, when an action is brought against the refusal of a building permit. In most federal states, the person concerned must first lodge an objection against an administrative act that is perceived to be unlawful. In the objection procedure, the authority has to re-examine whether its decision is lawful and expedient. 
If the objection is rejected, an appeal can be made to the administrative court. The first instance is the administrative court. The court of appeal is the higher administrative court called Oberverwaltungsgericht. In some cases, it's called Verwaltungsgerichtshof. The appeal instance is the Federal Administrative Court, the so-called Bundesverwaltungsgericht. Labor disputes usually arise from contracts between employees and employers. Therefore, there are actually conflicts under civil law. However, we have a special instance, the labor courts. In addition to disputes arising from employment relationships, labor courts also have jurisdiction over disputes concerning go determination. These concern both the rights of works, council and conflicts between trade unions and employers, associations over collective agreements and the leg legality of a strike. The labor courts have three levels of jurisdiction. The first instance is the labor court, Arbeitsgericht. The second instance is the regional labor court, Landesarbeitsgericht. The highest instance is the federal labor court, Bundesarbeitsgericht, seated in Erfurt. Labor courts are staffed by professional judges and honorary, ju honorary judges. Half of the honorary judges come from the employers, half of the employees. Labor court proceedings are less expensive than other court proceedings. The parties can conduct the legal dispute themselves or be represented by legal representatives of the trade union or employers association, or free of charge for members. An amicable settlement is attempted in advance. Decide on legal disputes in matters concerning social aspects. This can be social insurance, unemployment and accident insurance, war victims, benefits or child benefits. Social courts must investigate the facts of the case ex officio. The three instances of social jurisdictions are the social courts, Sozialgerichte, federal state social courts, Landessozialgerichte, as appeal instance and the federal social court, the Bundessozialgericht as review instance. In addition to professional judges, honorary judges participate in all instances. They are appointed, they are appointed from the circle of persons familiar with a specific matter. In social courts, with the execution of the federal social courts, anyone can represent themselves or be represented by experts from relevant associations. No court costs are incurred in social court proceedings. This is to enable everyone to assert claims that are subject to social jurisdiction. This is because these are usually claims that are necessary to cover the costs of living. The courts have jurisdiction over disputes between citizens and the fiscal authorities. In the vast majority of cases, these are complaints against tax assessments. First, an, an objection must be lodged against the notice of assessment from the tax office. If this remains unsuccessful, an action can be brought before the fiscal court. Appeals against rulings of the fiscal courts may be made to the federal fiscal court the Bundesfinanzhof. There are only these two instances. Tax courts are staffed with three professional judges and two honorary judges. The Federal Supreme Finance Court with five professional judges. The courts of the European Union exercise legal supervision over all community law to ensure the respect for the community law in interpretation and application of the founding treaties. The Court of Justice of the European Union is the supreme judicial body of the EU. 
It's abri abbreviated as ECJ or in German EUGH. It is no part of the branches of German courts, though it is part of the law system. It ensures cooperation with the courts of the member states, that the law of the European Union is interpreted and applied correctly and in the same way in all member states. The Court of Justice, ECJ, has one judge per member state. General Court, EGC, has jurisdiction at first instance in cases which are not referred to the specialized courts or directly to the Court of Justice. It also has jurisdiction at second instance to hear appeals against decisions of the specialized courts. At least one judge per member state. Specialized courts can be set up for specific subject areas. They may hear and determine cases at first instance. The general court has then the jurisdiction at second instance to hear and determine appeals against their decisions. After this short overview over the legal instances and areas of law and jurisdictions, let's take a last look on aspects of the method of law, of interpretation of law. In jurisprudence, interpretation can have different meanings. We distinguish the interpretation of a legal norm or a legal transaction. On the one hand, the interpretation of law. On the other hand, the interpretation of contracts or declarations of intent. The interpretation of law essentially includes the interpretation according to the so-called classical canon established by Friedrich Karl von Savigny. We have first the grammatical interpretation, second the historical interpretation, third the systematic interpretation and fourth the teleological interpretation. Grammatical interpretation strictly follows the wording of the law. This form of interpretation takes precedence over other forms of interpretation. The wording of the law must therefore not be exceeded in the interpretation. The wording thus forms the limits of interpretation. Historical interpretation, on the other hand, draws on the will of the legislator. To determine the will of the historical legislator, government drafts, resolutions, recommendations of the committees in the Bundestag and Bundesrat, minutes of planetary sessions and the reports of the rapporteurs of the mediation committee can be consulted. However, laws are often amended by reforms. This expresses the change of will of the legislator, which must also be taken into account in historical interpretation. Systematic interpretation aims at the relationship of individual norms to each other. The overall view of the norms in relation to each other in the law or in the sections of the law is considered. There must be a connection of meaning between the corresponding norms. A look at the title of the norm, the title of the section in which the norm is found and at nearby norms is particularly helpful in systematic interpretation. In exactly the same way, however, the position at the beginning or at the end of a law can provide information, for example, as to whether a norm applies to several sections or what meaning the norm should have in general. In teleological interpretation, the meaning and purpose of a norm is determined. A distinction is made between subjective and objective teleological interpretation. The subjective teleological interpretation focuses on the purpose that the historical legislator had in mind when enacting the norm. In fact, 
subjective teleological interpretation is a subcase of historical interpretation. The objective teleological interpretation, on the other hand, focuses on what the meaning and the purpose of the norm is from a current point of view. The intention of the law, note, not the legislator's intention, is asked. There are other aspects of the interpretation of law. The most important one, the result of the interpretation has to be in accordance with the higher law. Especially, the interpretation has to be in accordance with the basic law, the German Grundgesetz, and in accordance with the European law. An example, directives issued by the European Union are directly applicable to every member state, so that national rules have to be observed and follow the values and rules of such directives. The aspects are special forms of systematic interpretation. That's all for this first unit. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope my English was not so bad that you couldn't hear any longer. Till the next time.